Tsipela, President Jacob Zuma, Tsipela. Mata. Mata. Viva SACP, viva. Viva Kosatu, viva. Viva Sanko, viva. Ro Young Lions, Ro. Watinta Bafas. Lekana Mofas. Comrades, uh, thank you very much and welcome to the last centenary lecture of the year celebrating the 100 years of the existence of our glorious movement, the African National Congress. We don't have time, and therefore there may be other things that we would have wanted to do which we would not do because of time constraints. I'm now going to take this opportunity to welcome on stage Reverend uh, Kuno, accompanied by other reverends and bishops, so that they can quickly take us through prayers. Welcome to Tlokwe Municipality here in Port Chefstrong, a town council that, of course, got notoriety in the past week or so after that uh, ANC uh, confidence of no vote in the ANC mayor. But that, of course, that is not the reason we are here this afternoon. The reason we are here, we're bringing you the last of the 12 lectures that we've been bringing you since January, celebrating the ANC's leadership. Each month, the ANC has been honoring one of its former president. Well, today, it's, of course, in honor of the incumbent, the current president of the ANC, Jacob Kedley Tekisa. Zuma. That lecture will be delivered by the ANC's deputy uh, president, Khalima Mutlande. The president himself is not going to be here this afternoon. He had to rush to a Sadek Troika meeting to discuss uh, the worsening situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, we're going to go inside just to give you a little taste of what is to come before we continue with this special broadcast brought to you by SABC News. Well, as you can see there, all the people who are attending um, this particular lecture here in Postestrom, the ANC deputy president who will be delivering that lecture sitting here and right next to him um, behind the flame is Manduli, the wife of the president, President Jacob Zuma. This is a live broadcast brought to you by SABC News, the 12th in this lecture series that started way back in uh, the Free State in January. Well, joining me now is uh, Tutuzile Zuma, who is the daughter of the president. Well, today, of course, is that day when the ANC is paying tribute to President Jacob Zuma. As a family, how do you feel? Uh, we're very excited and uh, we're very proud of uh, our dad and uh, everything that he's done for the struggle for the ANC and for the country so far. As a family man, what can you say about him? <laughs> what you see is what you get, actually. Uh, but he's also just lots of fun. Uh, he's the type of dad that will grab a soccer ball and kick it with, with us around. So he's just very easy. Has he been like that, I mean, um, throughout? Or is it something that perhaps uh, as he was getting older, then he was relaxing a bit? Otherwise, he was all tough and focused um, on the struggle and all of that. Has he been like that the whole time? 
He has always been like that, and I think that um, having kids in the struggle, uh, we were probably his uh, release kind of center where he never had to think about that for too long and enjoy the family time. We were like a distraction to say. Is, is there something that you think um, a lot of us perhaps don't know or don't sort of tend to appreciate about your father? There is a lot. Um, I think that um, a lot of people do take him for granted. He has done so much for the country and I feel that um, he needs to be appreciated. And that's why I'm also very excited, just like the whole family is, that he is being celebrated uh, today. What makes you say that though? I mean, what sort of things or incidents have you, or things that you've looked at and felt, actually they should be appreciating my dad a lot more than they are doing, or they shouldn't be doing or saying what they are saying about him. What, 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 why do you say that? Uh, I think I wish that they would spend more time on focusing on what he has done and uh, the differences he has made uh, instead of trying to, uh, what we call, they playing the, the, the person and not the ball. So focus on his politics and what he, the difference he's done in the country. If there's one thing you would still want him to do um, as a family, what, what would that be? For the family and not for the struggle, not for the country, just for you as a family. Is that something that you would like him to do more of? For you? I think uh, he is where his heart wants to be and uh, we have accepted that and respect that and we support him with all of that but the one thing that I'll probably want to do more with him is uh, we used to do the uh, drives uh, through the garden route with him so I'd like to do that again with him. And it doesn't look like he's gonna do that? Uh, <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> with, with more years, it would appear that he's going to spend actually again doing the job that he's doing. Uh, are you worried that you're going to get less and less of that? Uh, wherever he's deployed, uh, I'm sure that we'll try and find time. Good luck and thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Zile Zuma, the daughter of President Jacob Zuma. Well, you're watching a live broadcast of the 12th in the lecture series um, that we've been bringing you since uh, January, the ANC, uh, part of the ANC's anniversary, 100 years um, uh, in existence as a party and as a movement mobilizing uh, African people. Um, and then, of course, later to include um, everybody in South Africa, black or white. You saw earlier um, the, some of the, the president's wives. Uh, of course, President Jacob Zuma has, made, has never made a secret of his life as a polygamist a choice. He has had to defend um, um, to his critics. There they are, um, um, led, of course, by Manduli, common knowledge um, that he does have, uh, he has married five times. He, he has three wives, two fiancés, and uh, 20 no children. Um, when he took office in 2009, a lot of people uh, asking who would be the first lady and so on and so on. But it looks like the um, uh, president uh, and the government has found a way of addressing those and dealing with uh, those questions. Um, Premier of KwaZulu-Natal, Zueli Mkize, whose name has come up um, as well. Uh, he has been nominated for... Um, one of the top six positions in the, in the ANC. Well, you're watching a live broadcast 
of the 12th lecture in this series that the ANC started back in January in honor of its past presidents, all of that part of the 100 years um, that the ANC has been in existence. Well, today, the focus being on incumbent Jacob Zuma, and uh, today's lecture going to be delivered by Khalima Mutlante, the deputy president of the African National Congress. Well, for a brief look into the life and times of Jacob Zuma, here's an insert prepared for us by Tebucho Alexander. Songs of Freedom. President Jacob Zuma in his element, his dulcet tones, a popular feature of recent ANC gatherings. It's been a long and somewhat rocky road to the top for the son of this northern KwaZulu Natal enclave of Inkandla. At 16 in 1959, Jacob Zuma joined the ANC. His political awareness coincided with Sharpeville and the subsequent banning of the liberation movements, giving rise to the armed struggle. In 1963, Zuma was recruited to Nkonto Wesizwe and the South African Communist Party by his mentor, Moses Mapita. A year later, he was arrested with 45 new recruits near Zerust as he tried to skip the country for military training abroad. He found himself on Robben Island after being convicted with conspiring to overthrow the government and given a 10-year sentence. On his release in 1973, Zuma resumed political activity, working under Heri Kuala, with the responsibility to reestablish the ANC's underground in Natal. After Kuala's arrest in 1975, Zuma fled to Swaziland, where a year later he was detained, along with Tabombeki, by that country's authorities. Fearing their kidnapping by Pretoria agents, as had happened with other activists imprisoned in Swaziland, the ANC leadership intervened, resulting in their release and deportation to Mozambique. In Mozambique, Zuma dealt with thousands of activists who had fled South Africa after the Soweto uprising in June 1976, while focusing on internal underground work. And so began his rapid rise through the ranks of the party. In 1977, he ascended to the influential ANC National Executive Committee. By 1984, Jacob Zuma had become Deputy Chief Representative of the ANC in Mozambique. This coincided with Mozambique and South Africa signing the Nkomati Accord, a non-aggression pact under which Mozambique would not support the ANC and South Africa RENAMO. Despite the accord, Zuma remained in Mozambique, becoming the ANC's Chief Representative there. But Pretoria pressure on the former Portuguese colony led to his departure for the ANC head office in Lusaka in 1987. There, he was appointed to head the ANC underground and shortly after became intelligence chief. He was among the first ANC leaders to return to South Africa to begin negotiations following the ANC's unbanning in February 1990. The talks led to the signing of the Groteskia Minute, an agreement outlining the return of exiles and release of political prisoners. In November 1990, Zuma was elected ANC chairperson in southern Natal, where he took a leading role in fighting violence in the region. This would eventually result in a number of peace accords between the ANC and the Inkata Freedom Party, and eventual peace in Natal. At the ANC Durban Conference in 1991, the party's first in South Africa since 1959, Zuma was elected ANC Deputy Secretary General. He was among the ANC representatives attending the Convention for Democratic South Africa, or CODESA. By 1993, Zuma was heavily involved in the negotiations between the ANC and the IFP, and when further violence erupted in Natal, he was deployed to the province to cement peace between the two parties. He was elected ANC National Chairperson and in December 1994, the Chairperson of the ANC in Natal. An exception was made to the ANC Constitution allowing Zuma to hold the two positions simultaneously. Zuma joined the KZN Provincial Government as MEC for Economic Affairs and Tourism. His climb up the ANC ranks continued at the party's Mafeking National Conference in December 1997 when he was elected party deputy president. Two years later, he became South Africa's deputy president. 
During his tenure, Zuma traveled across Africa mediating in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda and Burundi. Zuma's legal woes can be traced back to 2002 when he was implicated in the corruption trial of associate Shabir Sheikh, who would, three years later, be convicted of corruption and fraud relating to bribes he allegedly paid to Zuma. On Sheikh's conviction, State President Tabumbeki relieved Zuma of his duties of state. NC leaders accepted Zuma's offer to vacate the party office while clearing his name, only for the decision of delegates of the party's 2005 National General Council the party's most influential midterm review structure. Soon after, Zuma's home was raided by the Scorpions, a move he challenged in court but lost, leading to the reinstatement of the corruption charges by the state. Then, in November 2005, Zuma is accused of rape, a charge for which he went on trial the following year. He argued that the sex was consensual, acknowledging that he had made a mistake by having unprotected sex with an HIV-positive woman. He was acquitted in May 2006 and immediately reinstated as NC Deputy President. In December 2007, the NC's Pulukwane National Conference elected him party leader. Following his election to the NC presidency, Zuma was charged with corruption, fraud and money laundering. Come September 2008, a month after Zuma's trial began, the ANC National Executive Committee recalled Mbeki, essentially an ANC deployee, from his position as head of state. Following the NPA's withdrawal of all 16 charges against Zuma in May 2009, he became the president of a democratic South Africa. Later this month, Jacob Zuma heads to the NC National Elective Conference in Mangawung, the site of the party's formation a century ago, almost certain of re-election as ANC president for a second term. The jury is out on Jacob Zuma's political legacy, but his reputation as a political survivor is without dispute. Well, that insert prepared for us by Debucho Alexander. If you've just joined us, you're watching a live broadcast of the 12th in the lecture series that the ANC started back in January in the Free State. The last ANC president to be honored this month is incumbent Jacob Zuma, who is not here this afternoon. He has had to go to a SADC Troika meeting, which is looking into the worsening um, situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But uh, in his absence, of course, but also in his honor, Deputy President, uh, ANC President Khalima Motlante is going to deliver that lecture in honor of uh, Jacob Zuma. Um, a short while ago, uh, ANC national spokesperson uh, Jackson Mtembu introduced the family members who are here, three of the president's wives are here, and uh, so is uh, one of his brothers. Uh, he introduced them all, but he also introduced both the provincial and national um, leadership of the ANC that is currently here. Um, and uh, less than a minute ago, the ANC's chairperson in the province of the Northwest, Supra Mahomapilo, bemoaning the fact that the ANC lost power in the city of Tok, where, which is where we are. As many of you will, I'm sure, remember, uh, just over a week ago, the ANC lost um, the control of the Tokwe municipality to their DA in an incident that shocked everyone where ANC people deployed in the municipality actually voted against their own mayor who we did speak to a short while ago before we started this broadcast but we will of course be bringing you that interview um, a little while later. For now though let's have a look at what's going on inside this hall where the lecture in honor of uh, uh, Jacob Gedeklegi Sazuma is currently away. The lecture itself hasn't deliv it been delivered as yet, but um, the, 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 the function itself got underway um, a short while ago. Bad into issues of progress. That's why we came to a conclusion that there is a need for us to embark on what we call the necessary rebranding and repositioning of the Northwest province. But we can only change the face of our province if we work together. 
We can only change the face of our province if we emphasize commonalities among ourselves and we do not focus more on the negatives. And we can only succeed if we pull together. Samba song, some track. Because if we do not some track, if we don't pull together, and we pull in different directions, we will not be able to change the face of our province. We will not be able to reposition the Northwest among the provinces in South Africa. So I hope that all of us, when we move forward, next year we are doing 100 and, 101 years as the ANC. One of the things we are going to do is to... Well, joining us now is the former mayor of Tokwe, which is right here where we are in Porchestrom. Mayor, an incident, of course, that uh, took everybody by surprise how the ANC lost the vote in you uh, in this area. Yes, it was a, a 2019 vote after the vote of no confidence was passed on me. But it's not all lost. Um, we're looking at the process because of the Municipal Systems Act, as well as our own rules of order that are saying we can't rescind our resolution within a period of three months. After three months, we'll bring back the hope to our people and take control of the city again. Well, as far as um, most South Africans are concerned, um, the ANC, under your leadership, as it were, slept on the job. Well, uh, these things do happen. It's in politics. But don't forget where you are. You are in one of the best run cities in the country. I was removed on Monday. And on Thursday, there was a report from the Auditor General's office, an unqualified report. I'm looking around in the province which other municipality is going to get such a report. You'll know that we are in one of the cities which is best run, uh, financially viable, a city that is poised to achieve the best for the people. Now, let's talk about how now you uh, come the three-month uh, period that you're talking about. Um, how, what is the strategy, what's the plan, what's going to happen, how do you hope to regain um, um, the, 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 your, the seat that you lost? The ANC has given clear instructions to all its councillors that they must go back into their municipality and get in, in, in as a unit, a unit that will vote with its majority, a majority that cannot be overruled by a minority like it has happened. And, and that is what we'll do. We'll have to come back and say there can be no way that the minority can rule over the majority. The situation is untenable. And maybe we should also pass a vote of no confidence in the mayor. Because if you are the majority, the minority can never rule. Did you get a bit of a tongue lashing, perhaps, uh, um, from, the, from Lutuli House? It was irresponsible of us to behave in the manner in which we did. We took responsibilities and authorities that are not vested in us. We are aware that it was not supposed to happen. Those who pass the vote of no confidence on the executive mayor, who is deployed by the ANC, which is not their responsibility because they are equally deployed, did what was not their responsibility. And therefore, the ANC, yes, did tell us that we acted outside of our mandate. Lessons that you personally learned uh, from this episode, uh, not only for you, but also for the, for the, for the ANC. Look, look, we, I think we are too confident as a uh, majority ANC councillors. We thought that we can roll over other people and did not make our calculations correct. I think the ANC is aware about this thing that we shouldn't play with the confidence that the people bestow on us. And that is what we are prepared to do and prepared to learn from. Forever respect our people, forever give them the hope and the confidence, forever not take their vote for granted, forever delivering the service 
in terms of what our manifesto said we must be doing. Well, thank you very much and all the best. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Well, the former mayor of uh, Trogwe, who are, of course, are going to try very hard, as he says, to regain the majority and also with that the position of the executive mayor of the city of Trogwe. The national chairperson, Umambale Gambete. Members of the national executive. Well, the president's daughter is on the podium as we speak, giving a tribute from the family. Let's take a listen. Leaders of the various structures of the ANC and the mass democratic movement, the families of former presidents of the ANC who are here today, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a politician, so I'll say all protocol observed. <laughs> I'm one of Baba's children, and I'll be speaking on behalf of the Zuma family, some of whom are here today as well. Let me take this opportunity to join with the many voices in congratulating the ANC for 100 years of selfless struggle. We as a family are honored to be a part of what has been and continues to be the momentous centenary celebrations. First and foremost, we would like to thank the ANC. Even though we're here to celebrate the contribution made by Ubaba to the ANC, we feel it is imperative that we acknowledge and celebrate the contribution made by the ANC to Ubaba. The ANC has honestly and truly molded him into the exceptional human being that he is today. <laughs> Thus, in celebrating Ubaba as a product of the ANC, what we're actually doing is celebrating and honoring this great movement. Over and above that, we would like to thank the ANC for its continuous selfless struggle for, li for the liberation of all South Africans especially as young people like myself, who do not have to experience the harsh realities of living under the apartheid state. We know the ANC will continue its struggle, thus we are wishing the ANC many more years so that we can build on the gains made thus far in creating a better life for all South Africans. One of the most remarkable things about Ubaba, besides his quick wits and infectious laugh, of course, is his humility. He has remained completely humble and grounded, and a testament to this is how he treats people. For Ubaba, whether you're a head of state or an ordinary South African, he gives you the same time of day. This is one of the main reasons why he literally works himself to the bone. On an ordinary day, he easily sleeps in the early hours of the morning and is up again by 6 a.m because he constantly gives his time to the people that he's serving, despite how taxing it may be on him. Always putting everyone before himself, his only motivation is to serve his people. What drives Ubaba and gets him up in the morning, every morning, is one thing and one thing only, and that's serving the African National Congress and the people of South Africa. Somehow, though, in the midst of all his commitments and his extremely busy schedule, he somehow manages to spend time with all his children and family at large. These are qualities of a selfless leader and a servant of the people, qualities I can only hope that young people like myself are able to learn from whilst we still have that opportunity. My father loves the ANC with every single fiber of his being. He cannot identify himself outside of this home. One day we were having breakfast and we were just chatting, and then I decided to ask him, Daddy, why did you decide to have so many children? <laughs> <laughs> and his answer was, <clears throat> well, my dear, I am increasing the vote of the ANC. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 
And as a child myself, I can confirm here today that he is 100% correct. <laughs> it has not always been an easy road for Ubaba, but what's remarkable is that he has stayed true to himself every step of the way, even at the worst of times. He is a source of strength to our family, and I'm sure to many other people as well. Personally, I find it very odd when people think Ubaba has so many children because there are 21 of us. Because the reality of the situation is that Ubaba has way more children than just 21. He is literally a father to the entire Zuma clan and many other South Africans whom he cares for both in his personal capacity as well as his capacity as their leader and a public servant. He leads in every aspect of his life and he's extremely family orientated. He has single-handedly brought together and unified the entire Zuma clan. He really is the glue that holds our family and the Zuma clan together. He's a leader in the home and in the community, doing everything in his power and in his means to better the lives of people. As we all know, he has defied all odds, hailing from a very poverty-stricken part of rural KwaZulu-Natal, our home in Gandla. He now stands a self-educated man, despite the fact that he was without real formal schooling, and he's a head of state today. This is not only a testament to the greatness of the man himself, but it's actually a testament to the African National Congress as well. It is only the African National Congress that can bring the best out of any human being and mold them to truly become a giant among men. Ubaba is a living example of what it means to be a revolutionary, a selfless leader, and an absolutely amazing dad. His pride inspires us with confidence every single day. Well, we know that there are those out there who constantly see a proud man and revolutionary as otherwise, a proud African man and revolutionary as otherwise, we as South Africans know that Umbaba is a beacon of hope to restoring our dignity and pride in who we are. We're not confused as a family or a nation as to who we are, and we're actually very happy that neither is our father or our president. He's made us to be proud Africans, and to that we're very grateful. In addition to that, he's also made us understand the meaning of the liberation struggle and the link between the struggle, the ANC, and the family, and that there are no contradiction between these. That's why, despite how busy he is, he really has our full support. And it's also how he's earned the support, respect, and admiration of our entire clan. Daddy, if you're watching or not, <laughs> we are forever indebted to your contribution as a freedom fighter and a servant of the people, as well as that of all your other comrades with whom you fought alongside. Unfortunately, I never had the privilege of knowing our grandparents, but one thing I know for sure is that they're proud of their son and the legacy that he has left and will continue to leave. We're lucky to have such an amazing dad, and the ANC and the people of South Africa are lucky to have such greatness at their disposal. We wish the ANC all the best as it enters into its next centenary. Long live the ANC and long live President Gedlechegisa Mshanganyelwa Zuma. You will never want. Hey, you will never. You will never want. Hey, you will never. When I was swing, come on. Swing, come on. And see when I do it. How swing, come on. Swing, come on. When I do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Indeed, indeed, indeed. Ritle go go pa kwaire a rona go retle go re opela Lisa le sidinga lakho. Ke kwaire a rona ya ditswerere. Le kana la ibiletsa matsogo la ibiletsa mogolo kwa. You're watching a live broadcast of the 12th lecture of that the ANC uh, is having today. That, of course, this lecture being the last in the series that started back in January. You saw a short while ago one of the president's 21 children um, to Tugile talking, paying tribute to his father. Just to correct a little uh, mistake I made earlier, I said the president has three wives and uh, two fiancés. He actually has four wives. The president has four wives. Apologies about that one. While you're watching a live broadcast brought to you by SABC, news I said the last in this lecture series today it's in tribute uh, it's a tribute is being paid to the incumbent ANC president Jacob and the person who's going to deliver that lecture is Khalima uh, Mutlante, the deputy president of the ANC. The president himself is not here. He has gone to a meeting of the Sadek Troika that is discussing the situation in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Let's go back inside. Lisa Lisa and then Pina Eki Pinde Neo Pelo Akama Wakiti, Kulwa Roboli Lisumelo Bubedi, nineteen twelve Harner Toma Kwakwa Bidia Karata Kulutene Lady Abosicha of African National Congress. So Rabonte Tumpo Mohio, Nagan Tahor Lebatova Tumpang, Baba Tata.
thank you very much. And I also want to thank you once more for joining the choir when we sang that important historical song of the African National Congress. Comrades, I'm now going to give over to our national chairperson. Me baleka mbete. Mangwana utswara tipa kafabo khale. O tlhaloganya sentle setswana ha re re o se bone nong go rakalala go dimo go atla se ke ga yo So I'm going to give the national chairperson the opportunity to introduce the main speaker of the day comrade national chairperson Chairperson, uh, on this occasion when I stand before an audience that's going to receive a centenary lecture for the last time, I thank you for being here. Because without you, we wouldn't be here. Because we we're not going to come here and speak to the seats in this hall. Comrades, we have come a long way. When we started, we said it was going to be a year-long celebration. It sounded like a dream. But here we are. It's the second time we are coming to this province. We will not explain in detail why we have decided to come for the second time to this province. homework here your homework here in Ulay. Comrades, it is with pride that I stand before you to introduce one of the long serving members of the African National Congress. A comrade who, when he was much, much younger than the person you see today, was recruited into the underground and participated in recruiting comrades and cadres of the African National Congress, many of whom went into exile and were trained to serve in different capacities, especially in the military sector. I introduce to you a comrade who then because of his own activities, ended up being arrested and served 10 years in prison. I introduce to you a cadre who has served in the working, in the working class movement, in the trade union movement. He was the general secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers before he became the Secretary General of the African National Congress for 10 years. I introduce to you, comrades, a comrade who most definitely has served in many capacities for a very long time, and in fact has finished 15 years as one of the top six officials of the African National Congress. I stand here with pride and invite our Deputy President, Comrade Khalima Mutlante, to come and deliver the lecture, which is the last lecture in a series of 12 lectures of all male presidents. 
That's our homework, eh? But it is with pride, Comrade Khalima, that I invite you to come and deliver the lecture on our current president, Comrade Jacob Kedeshegisa Mthanganyelwa Zuma. Matata Matata Hayo Amanda Comrade Chairperson, Comrade Balegambete, Comrade Deputy Secretary General, Comrade Tandi Mudise. The provincial chairperson, Comrade uh, Supra Mauma Pelo, and the rest of the leadership of the province here present, allow me to salute the family of our president, Comrade Jacob Zuma, Abagwan Namalala. Members of the National Executive Committee here present, Kabazela, Comrade Zuelim Kize, Chairperson of the Province of KZN, <laughs> members of the regional committees, leadership of the leagues, distinguished guests, comrades and friends. I am honored to present this lecture on the life and times of the 12th President of the African National Congress, Comrade Jacob Gelechegi Samshanganyelwa Zuma Umsholozi. This is the last of the ANC Centenary Lecture Series on the lives and times of the ANC presidents. In this regard, this lecture is no easy task as it deals with the subject of a sitting president of both the African National Congress and the Republic of South Africa. I suppose that uh, a good place to start is by recognizing that Comrade Jacob Zuma is a child of his environment. Such an environment would include the immediate family circumstances he was born into, the prevailing conditions in South Africa at the time, and the organizations in existence at the time. Life as we know 
is a function of necessity, and in order to understand the life and times of anybody, we must be able to trace the environment, experiences, and material conditions that shaped their outlook. Comrade Jacob Zuma was born on the 12th of April, 1942, in the village of Kwangamalala in Kandla, KwaZulu-Natal. Kwangamalala was, like many villages of the time, rural and reliant on subsistence production supplemented by the remittances of migrant workers. His parents were of modest means since his father worked as a policeman and his mother worked as a domestic servant. His father passed away when he was still very young. After his father's death, he and his mother left for his mother's parental home in Kwamapumulo, where he began heading cattle while other children of his age attended school. This was at the time when the world was still gripped by the Second World War, and South Africa was experiencing rapid industrialization, which brought with it the growth of urbanization and the emergence and growth of the trade union movement. The 1940s, South Africa was characterized by heightened political consciousness and activity as evidenced by the drafting of the African claims in 1943 in response to the Atlantic Charter, the amendment of the ANC Constitution to allow for the creation of the ANC Women's League and the ANC Youth League. The Doctors' Pact of 1947, as well as the adoption of the Program of Action of the ANC in 1949. It was also a time when the Nationalist Party ascended to power as a party which had sympathies to the fascist in Nazi Germany and thus in office, never lost time in elevating the notion of racial segregation into state policy. The 1950s was a decade when this apartheid government implemented some of the most brutal and draconian laws. In fact, its first law was the Suppression of Communism Act followed by other laws such as the Group Areas Act. And in December 1956, the whole leadership of the Congress Alliance was detained, arrested, and thrown into prison. This was the beginning of the treason trial. Those who were not part of the 156 arrested were either banned or put under house arrest. Because of this atmosphere, the ANC found itself robbed of its experienced leadership. And therefore, people with little experience, ANC culture and background came to the fore and occupied leading positions within the organization and public platforms. Brian Bunting in the biography on Moses Kotani says, and I quote, the emergence of the Africanists in this period can be explained by a number of factors. In the first place, the overall situation in the country was tense. Unemployment amongst all sections of the population was rising. The economic growth rate was declining and the gap between the white and black wage earners was widening. The poor black majority was getting poorer at the very moment when government apartheid pressures were growing. Therefore, revolts broke out in a number of reserves against government 
removal plants, cattle culling, deposition of anti-government chiefs, the extension of passes to women, and other unpopular measures. In addition to this, it was a frustration with the passbook laws and Bantu education. Banting further says, and I quote, but there were many groups attempting to divert the ANC from the course and from its basic policies. It is this background that shaped Comrade Jacob Zuma's early political consciousness. When he settled in Umkumbani, Katomana, he joined SACTU, the South African Congress of Trade Unions, in 1959. It was also at this time that he was first given the opportunity of education through SACTU night schools. After attending meetings of SACTU, he was also recruited into the ANC Youth League and the ANC, and later joined Umkonto Wesizu. Comrade Zuma has fond memories of the mass struggles and the struggles of workers led by the South African Congress of Trade Unions. The Sharpeville massacre and the burning of the ANC in 1960 necessitated a change in the methods of struggle, shifting gear to include armed struggle. Comrade Zuma was amongst the first of those recruited to join Umkonto Wesizwe. He was recruited into Mkonto Wesizwe by none other than the stalwart of our struggle, Comrade Moses Mabida, and participated in sabotage operations. In June 1963, he was part of a group arrested here in this province near Zirast for further, and was charged for furthering the aims of, a, of the banned African National Congress. He was tried, and one of his favorite chestnuts, one of the stories he normally tells about that period, was how they were all brought together in Pretoria, comrades who came from Cape Town, from other parts of the northern uh, Transvaal then, and KwaZulu-Natal, and they were all detained in Pretoria at the same time. Among people who were there were comrades like Comrade Mlangeni and Mlangeni Stwalandwe, uh, John Kadimeng, the late Comrade Uhuna from Cape Town, uh, and many, many others. And he's fond of telling the story of how, as they were all uh, detained in Pretoria, with no preparation in understanding Africans. And the warders, prison warders, all spoke one language. They spoke Africans. And so he tells the story of how this warder came around to the cell and inquired in Africans, V. Mark Rassiso. <laughs> and among these comrades was a comrade called Russell. And so, because he did not understand Africans, Comrade Russell jumped forward and said, I am Russell. <laughs> and in prison language, he was uh, sentenced to spare diet. Uh, in Hoi Africans, they simply said to him, Jetlache yet, meaning that he's already had all his meals for the following day. They were then put on trial and convicted and sent to Robben Island serving a range of sentences. Some were serving six, five, eight, ten years, fifteen years, twenty, eighteen years, and so on. Upon arrival on Robben Island, they brought with them different experiences as ANC members because there were those who belonged to the ANC only, who were members of the ANC only. 
and there were those among them who were members of the ANC and SAP2 and various trade unions. And there were those among them who belonged to the ANC, the Communist Party of South Africa, and the trade unions. And so they brought with them different experiences. Those of them who were, and Comrade Zuma was part of this group, who had been in Satu uh, were used to attending classes, classes on labor theory, classes on philosophy, classes on political economy. And so they began, they started initiating uh, discussions and conducting similar classes. And these classes, because they could not be attended by everybody, created tensions. So the ANC had to discuss what to do, how to handle these classes. And of course, with the presence of the leadership in the form of the Rivonia trialists, they debated these issues and concluded that the ANC must conduct the classes officially. So a program was developed and classes became compulsory for all uh, ANC members. Comrade Zuma was one of those who were in charge of conducting these classes. Uh, many of the comrades who were his leaders and teachers in Saktu, comrades such as uh, Stephen Lamini, Harry Guala, Billy Naya, were also on Robben Island at the time. And so they were able to revive this practice of conducting classes. That is how Robben Island became an informal university in its own right. When Comrade Zuma was release, released from prison in 1973, having served 10 years, perhaps let me take one step back just to illustrate the point that at that time on Robben Island, conditions were very, very brutal, extremely brutal. The orders would inquire from the prisoners as to whether there are any among them who were, in, you know, qualified motor vehicle drivers. So if you have a driver's license, they say, okay, step forward, and you step forward. And then they were given wheelbarrows whose wheels were made of steel. And they had to push these wheelbarrows full of stones from the quarry, full of lime, through sand, because Robben Island is all sand. There's no hard surface. And so these were very difficult times. And the assault of prisoners was common sight. But of course among them were comrades like uh, Natu Babani, Babenia, an Indian comrade who was a member of SACTU and the Natal Indian Congress, who had perfected the art of dying. So whenever they were assaulted, Comrade Babenia would die. <laughs> and the warders would have to stop the assault and attend to him. That's how he used to save them uh, from such assaults. Program director, it is this uh, which prepared Comrade JZ to be a seasoned freedom fighter who now understood how to conduct underground work. Because part of the population on Robben Island consisted of comrades who were arrested because of poor timekeeping. When a meeting is set for 10 o'clock, they turn up at 5 past 10. And by that time, all the comrades have left, 
only the security police are waiting. And so they got arrested. So one of the lessons you learn is keeping time, the importance of keeping time, that 10 o'clock means 10 o'clock. It doesn't mean 5 to 10, it does not mean 5 past 10, it means 10 o'clock. So comrade president emerged from prison, of course, with other comrades at the time, fully prepared to continue the struggle through the underground work. It was at that stage that Comrade JZ became involved in the rebuilding of underground structures under the leadership of Harry Gwala. Harry Gwala, who was popularly known as Umtom Dala, was a teacher, a trade unionist, a member of the party, a member of MK, a member of the ANC, and so was an embodiment of the alliance. Comrade Zuma was responsible for recruiting young people for military training, arranging their safe passage out of the country through Mozambique and back into the country. This mission was later compromised following the arrest of his comrades, including Comrade Harry Gwala, Comrade Anthony Kaba Mfenendala, Comrade uh, Zakele Mdlalose, Comrade Matthews Meiwa, Comrade John Nene, Comrade Azaria Ndebele, and all of Comrade Truman Makubani were all arrested. And this then necessitated that Comrade President Jacob Zuma should leave the country and go into exile. In exile, he was involved in the preparation of underground work and facilitating the transfer route between Natal and Swaziland. I had the privilege of meeting him when he arrived in Swaziland. And strange enough, our discussion in also included experience on Robben Island. And so, in a sense, I got my induction on what to do and how to behave on Robben Island from Comrade JZ at that time. He established a valuable network and ensured an efficient Natal machinery for the ANC. He worked with uh, very seasoned comrades like uh, com the late Duma, uh, late Joseph Nduli, uh, the late uh, Gacheni, Cleopas uh, Ndlovu, and they formed a formidable team in Swaziland at the time. But in March 1976, Comrade Zuma, together with Comrades uh, Mbegi and Albert Lomo, were arrested by the Swazi security police. And because they were detainees at uh, Matsapa prison, the Swazi police who were working hand in glove with the South African security police had made arrangements for them to be flown out of Swaziland, but via the O.R. Tambo Airport now, which was then known as the Jensmats Airport, to Botswana, so en route to Botswana, that they would leave Swaziland, fly via Johannesburg, and off to Botswana. Clearly, this was an arrangement to hand them over to the South African security police. And it was thanks to the late comrade Stanley Mabizela who was uh, at the time uh, based in Swaziland, who then made interventions and a lot of noise uh, to such an extent that their flight, their plane was rerouted to Maputo and that is how they escaped being handed over to the South African police. It was this event which persuaded former President Oliver Tambo 
to decide that uh, it is important for a much more senior leader also to be based in Swaziland. And Comrade Moses Mabida was dispatched to base in Swaziland. Comrade Zuma helped cement relations between the ANCs. the ANC and fraternal organizations such as Frelimo. And in his role as the deputy chief representative of the ANC in Maputo, Comrade Zuma, who was later given the responsibility of being full representative of the ANC during the Ngomati Accord, was able to cement the relationships between Frelimo and the ANC. He also served during that period on the ANC's military and political committees and the intelligence department at the ANC headquarters in Lusaka. In January 1987, he was appointed head of the underground structures and Chief of Intelligence Department in Lusaka. During that time, he focused on investigating the causes of deaths among ANC cadres who were infiltrated back into the country and were captured. Being a head of intelligence also gave him an invaluable insight into the operations of the apartheid intelligence structures and their in inhuman uh, atrocities. Dear comrades, President Zuma also played a critical role in the period which led to the peaceful transition of South Africa. Primarily because of his intelligence background, Comrade Zuma was instrumental in supporting the talks about talks after the release of Comrade Nelson Mandela and the unbanning of the political organizations in 1990. This period of negotiation was also marred by political violence by state security forces intent on derailing the transitional negotiations. President Zuma worked tirelessly through the Joint Working Committee of the UDF, then the ANC, COSATU, and South African Communist Party and Sanko in the early 90s, persuading and convincing leadership to pursue peace initiatives, resulting in a number of local peace accords and provincial agreements. This allowed for all the parties, including the security forces, to work together in a structured way in achieving peace and more importantly, making the security forces more accountable for their actions. It was during these early 90s that the ANC reorganized itself and reestablished its legal structures in the country. At that time, Comrade Zuma was then elected chairperson of the ANC's Southern Natal region, and a year thereafter, at the first ANC conference held in South Africa since 1959, he was elected Deputy Secretary General of the ANC. Comrade JZ also played a pivotal role in the reconstruction and development of our country after the demise of apartheid as part of the ANC delegation to Kodesa. He was later elected in Mangaung in 1994 as the national chairperson of the ANC and, of course, retained his position as chairperson of Southern Natal. And after the 1994 elections, Comrade Zuma was appointed MEC for Economic Affairs and Tourism in KwaZulu-Natal, a government which was headed by the IFP.
This posting allowed Comrade Zuma to make his contribution to ensuring that peace and stability in KwaZulu-Natal takes root. This work was important to Comrade Zuma as he was convinced that if KZN violence was not dealt with, it would destabilize the whole country. As indeed, at that time, the violence was transported to the reef through the single men's hostels uh, in and around the PWV region at the time, which is the Houghton province today. And in October 1998, President Zuma received the Nelson Mandela Award for Outstanding Leadership in recognition of his outstanding role in bringing about the end of violence in KwaZulu-Natal. But his role as a peacemaker did not just end in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, nor just in South Africa. He continues to utilize his negotiating skills, his patience, for the benefit of peace and stability on the entire continent of Africa. That is why <clears throat> when Comrade Nelson Mandela, as President of the Republic, was requested to continue the work which was initiated by the late Mualimu Julius Nyerere in negotiating peace in Burundi, Comrade Madiba asked Comrade JZ to assist him in that task. And when Comrade Madiba retired, that task was left squarely on the shoulders of Comrade JZ, who indeed took it to its logical conclusion and the result was peace, a peace agreement signed in 2002. Up to this day, Burundi is a stable country precisely because of Comrade JZ's negotiating skills. <laughs> During his tenure as Deputy President, Comrade Zuma was also involved in mediation between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. We know even today that situation remains unstable. There are conflicts in North Kivu, which once again involve Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In 1999, he was appointed as the Deputy President of the Republic, a position he held until he was relieved of his duties in June 2005. He continued serving as Deputy President of the African National Congress until he was elected as President of the organization in 2007. In 2009, Comrade Zuma was inaugurated as President of the Republic of South Africa on the 9th of May 2009. To better implement the resolutions and mandate of the 55th Third National Conference, Comrade Zuma restructured the administration and reconfigured government in line with his approach of an outcome-based governance. His mantra, which he repeats all the time, is that government should do things differently. He says there is no point, no advantage whatsoever to be gained from lamentations that we are the governing party, we should stop lamenting and begin to do things differently and respond promptly to the challenges and problems facing our people. To that end, he established the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Committee to give effect to the new growth path, as well as the National Development Plan. Among some of the greatest achievements of his government, we have had to contend with is the victory in the area of 
the struggle against HIV and AIDS. Through his sterling leadership, life expectancy has now been increased to 60. And the twin pandemics of HIV and TB have now been brought under control. <laughs> President Jacob Zuma's life, therefore, is an exemplar of how positive thinking thrives against all odds. And here I want to quote his own words when he was honored with an honorary degree by the Texas Southern University last year. And I quote, my passion for education makes me to strive tirelessly towards ensuring that every child who wants to learn obtains the opportunity to do so. My passion for education arose in part from my inability to get the education I desired as I came from a very poor background. I had an ambition then to become a teacher, a pastor, or a lawyer, but was then prevented by circumstances. However, on failing to go to school, I did not sit back and do nothing. I decided to educate myself, close quote. This spirit not ever to sit back is aptly captured in the words of Maya Angelou in her book entitled, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And she says in part, as I ate, she began the first in what I later called my lessons in living. She said, and I quote, I must always be intolerant of ignorance but understanding of illiteracy. That some people unable to go to school were more educated and more intelligent than college professors. She encouraged me to listen carefully to what country people called mother wit. In those homely sayings was couched as the collective wisdom of generations. This aptly captures who President Jacob Zuma is. President Jacob Zuma stands on the shoulders of giants who preceded him and evinces their courage, foresight, patience, as well as dexterity. Long live the spirit of Jacob Zuma. Long live. Long live. I thank you for your attention. Amanda. Matla. Tsetsepela, President Jacob Zuma. Tsetsepela. Ngangatela, President Jacob Zuma. Ngangatela. Matla. As the Northwest Province, we share the same philosophy with President Jacob Zuma that challenges are necessary platforms for success. Every challenge that you come across in life, you use it as a stepping stone towards your success. Now, you know from, from Thursday, until Monday, we were dealing with uh, very creative methods of 
making sure that the provincial nominations conference doesn't succeed. So we, we made sure that the nominations conference succeeds. And Kibatali Kopele Matsoho for that. Now there's one comrade, I can't see that comrade here. In the early hours of Sunday, around 4 o'clock in the morning, that comrade sang a song, and I'm going to sing it because I can't see that comrade here. We need Zuma, we need Zuma, yes, Zuma. We need Zuma, we need Zuma, Zuma, Fotewa. We need Zuma, we need Zuma, Zuma, well, ANC provincial chairperson in the Northwest Supra, Mahuma Pilo, was wrapping um, this lecture after um, those words, that lecture by ANC Deputy President Khalima Mutlante, uh, of course, a glowing tribute to the incumbent, the current ANC President Jacob Zuma, going back um, to the years, I mean, going on his back when he's uh, talking about where he was born, of course, and the things he did when he was a lot younger, uh, activism, how he got into um, the ANC movement, the roles he played um, that uh, led him to being incarcerated on Robben Island and thereafter um, going into um, exile, uh, playing uh, a big role in, in the underground intelligence of the African National Congress, but also as president um, of the ANC, what he has done. But even before then, as deputy president of the country, the peace roles, um, the peace in Burundi, for example, a, a lot of people will remember the critical role that uh, the president played there, uh, a role that has ensured that, in fact, that peace continues to hold even to this day. Uh, incidentally, he is pretty much on his way um, to Tanzania, where the Troika, uh, the Sadek Troika, is going to look into the situation over the next two days, is going to look into the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So those uh, peace uh, mediating skills will come in quite handily as someone who has seen it all, who has been in similar situations before, where he has, to have, he has had to bring together warring factions. That role that he has played previously will, I'm sure, play in very handy. But let's go back inside now for um, the last few minutes of uh, this particular session. Lots of uh, ANC leaders dancing there, William Kize uh, doing his thing. Let's go back, let's see what's going on inside.
Well, with that, with that centenary song that we've been hearing over the months, that we've been bringing you these lectures, it's goodbye from us. We thank you very much for watching, and we hope that all of us learned a thing or two about this rich history of our country, which includes, of course, um, the history of the African National Congress, which we've been bringing you since January. From me, Vuyam Vogo, and the rest of the crew, and this being the last in this lecture series, we say thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.